Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. And I am so grateful to have Professor David Kyle Johnson come back and talk to me again. And this is effectively his third appearance on the show. He first appeared in episode 146, as well as a bonus episode which was released to Patreon listeners five weeks ago and which is now available on the Economic Rockstar podcast and is available on any platform where you get your podcasts or if you get it through my website, economicrockstar.com, you can find it there also. So in that bonus episode, we actually started to talk about Soylent Green, the movie, the 1973 movie featuring Charlton Heston and because I hadn't watched it Kyle didn't want to spoil what happened at the end and urged me to have a look at it and maybe meet up again to have a talk about some economics and philosophical issues and questions that appear in the movie so we did just that and eventually met up and had a, a quite interesting conversation on some of the social philosophical and economic issues of the day So some of the economic themes that come up are on scarcity, on choice, overpopulation, production, consumption, altruism, inflation, pricing and equilibrium. And some of the philosophical issues and questions that are addressed really include if there was a situation where there is overpopulation. For example, in the movie, there's a population of 40 million people living in New York City compared to the present population of 8 million. And if there is such a devastation in terms of poverty levels and food scarcity, would we resort to cannibalism and would that be okay? And we don't mean gorging on human flesh and muscle. And the question really centers around saving the human race. There's also a poignant moment in the movie where one of the characters, Saul, decides to die by euthanasia. And we question... Should we have the right to die with dignity in the face of a terminal illness or the loss of hope or despair or even over your own moral principles? And these are quite difficult questions to ask. And if anyone is listening to the podcast and they come across this part in the episode where we discuss this type of question and you are affected by it, please reach out to your local Samaritans, no matter what country you're in, as they have over 400 centres in 38 countries. And I'm sure no matter where you are living, there are plenty of counselling services available and please, please use them. And if you can't pick up the phone and talk to any of these trained experts, talk to someone who's close to you or visit your local doctor. Try not to go it alone. If you've seen this movie, I hope the conversation today does us some justice. And if you've yet to see it, either go ahead with the episode, get the spoilers or press pause and watch the movie as soon as you can and come back and listen. And hopefully, again, you can enjoy this episode with the movie fresh in your mind. So once again, thanks very much for listening. I really appreciate you week in, week out, pressing play and spending time with both me and my guest. So enjoy this episode on the economics and philosophy of Soylent Green with Professor David Kyle Johnson. I'm afraid that the only way that we won't run in to the overpopulation problem eventually that Soylent Green depicts is because climate change takes care of it for us so that before we get to the point where we can't produce enough food to feed people, the climate will have killed enough of us off essentially that we won't end up to that point. But then again, that's not, that's not a better solution, right? Like that's a, a much worse, that's a much worse problem to have. Hi Kyle, how are you getting on? I'm getting on great. How are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. Yeah. All good. All good. Good. Um, How's your daughter? Ah, she's a lot, but she's a really good now. Yeah, she just fell on the kitchen floor, and the face got a lot of it, and pushed back her tooth, and you know there was a lot of blood and that, and she wouldn't eat then or talk for about three days. Oh my goodness! So she had to be on an IV drip then and stay overnight. Oh, oh no, that's too bad. But she's doing good now. Ah, she's flying at yeah. She's as bold and brave as ever now again. <laughs> that's good uh so i assume that you, you, you watch the film then i watched it yeah i didn't think i thought it was right. going to be longer do you remember i was saying i think it's about three hours long but it's not it's only an hour and a half oh is it really yeah. um it's it's 96 it's, minutes uh, i think yeah okay all right cool all right well i can't well i'm going to save all our talking for it on the air so i'll yeah i won't ask any more questions but uh oh i'm so glad i'm, I'm excited to talk about this 
Welcome back to the Economic Rockstar podcast, Kyle. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for having me on. And it's it's great, you know, because um, in the last conversation, we ended with talking about one of your lectures, and it was on Soylent Green. And because I hadn't watched it yet, you you decided not to ruin it on me. So, well, better idea for me to watch it and catch up again. Yes, I insisted that I not spoil it for you because I thought someone not being aware of the secret of Soylent Green was rare. And so I really wanted to, A, to have you have that treat, uh, and then B, I wanted to get your reaction and see what you thought about the film since, you know, see how you thought it aged since it's an older film and then whether you were genuinely surprised by the ending and all that. So I can't wait to talk about it. Yeah. So um, when was the last time you had watched this? Oh, gosh. Um, I watched it. I don't know if I sat down and watched it start to finish when I was prepping the course, yeah. uh, but I did watch parts of it again, like a pretty good chunk of it again when I was prepping the course. So it would have been within the last year or year and a half or whatever uh, when I watched it. But then before that, it had been my friends and I watched it like in high school or something like that. So mm-hmm. I've only seen it a, a couple of times. But um, yeah, it's it's hard to forget, though. Yeah. So um, where do we start with it? Do we we, we, we start, talk about the dystopian world? That it's kind of set in in 2022, even though the movie was made in 1973, I think. Yeah, so um, where, where I would like to start, I want to start with my question about, did you see it coming? Were you surprised by the ending? Did you find it disturbing? Tell me how you reacted to the ending. Yeah, look, I, I tried to predict the ending because you told me you didn't want to spoil it on me. So I said, right. yeah, I predict the ending. And... For some reason, I was. What's the name of the female lead in it? Lee is it or Leah? That that sounds right to me. I could look that up, but I, that that sounds right to me. But I she distracted me because I thought she had something to do with it. You know, it was too kind of uh, too sweet and okay. too um, unusual. I don't know what the name was given to at that. You know, the t- type of woman who was. I, I don't want to say much more about, about it just yet, but. I was thinking, Ray, she has something to do with this, and maybe she was a distraction as to what was going on with uh, Frank's investigation. But yeah, I I was surprised. I I was surprised, yeah. So did you figure it out before the end then, and and when did you figure it out? Yeah, I figured it out when um, Sam or Samuel was decided to to get euthanasia, Mm. and he just told Frank to go and find a proof. So right. when when he was kind of leading us into the garbage truck, which we saw earlier on during a mass riot over food scarcity, mm-hmm. he followed that truck or he he boarded that truck and ended up going into a garbage waste facility. And okay, then, so right about the, so it sounds like right about the time that Saul, like Saul's kind of a dying breath, he tells Frank the secret that Soylent Green is people, but you don't quite hear like the, the audience I didn't doesn't hear that. Hear it. Yeah, yeah, right, but. Yeah. So you kind of you kind of learn it with you kind of learn it with Frank, right? Like uh, with the, with the detective um, at the same time that he does, even though you don't hear. It. Okay, that's very cool. That's a very cool spot to learn it there. Interestingly, and then we can we can go on. That was Edward G. Robinson's last performance. He was dying of bladder cancer, and he died. I think it's like six days after they they ended principal photography on Soylent Green. No so he did that scene knowing it was his last scene, knowing that he was dying. And of course it's a scene where he is dying, but he didn't let anyone know like Charlton Heston didn't know the crew didn't know nobody, but him knew that he was dying. And a lot of people say that that's why that's really kind of the standout performance of the, of the movie. And that kind of stuff is because is because he actually was dying. But anyway, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. When you see that again, then really kind of, I suppose, it would touch your heart, you know, and you'd be, yeah, it is it is a special moment then if you were to look at it again, knowing that information. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is a, a kind of a spectacular scene, especially with that in mind. Yeah. So for those people who haven't heard or watched Soylent Green, um, yeah, obviously this is a spoiler. So it is Soylent Green is people. So Soylent Green is this uh, kind of, how could you call it, a wafer tin one square inch, yeah, two I, I square inch it, piece it, of green. Yeah, it's like I call it a green cheese. It is what it is. It's a green cheese. It. Yeah, it doesn't look very appetizing at all. Right. They they even sound like but plastic it, pieces when they fall together. 
Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. Right. Uh, but it's supposed to be it's like, you know, it's set. So we can now we can talk about the dystopian world uh, and talk about what Soylent Green is. So yeah. the, it's this dystopian world set in 2022 where like 40 million, 50 million people are living in New York City, whereas right now I think it's like eight million or something like that. Right. Like it's it's very overpopulated, very, very overpopulated future. And foodstuffs are very, very rare. And what most people eat are uh, is stuff from this Soylent Corporation. And in the past, it's been like Soylent Red. I think, or soil yellow that have yeah. had different different things, but now they have this new product called soil green, and it's a lot better. It tastes better, and it's got a lot more protein. It's a lot more nutritious than uh, other soil products in the past. And they say that it's made out of ocean plankton, and that's why it's green. This is because it has this deep sea ocean plankton in it. And then the movie follows uh, Charlton Heston's character Frank and his buddy Saul going through the process of learning that they investigate a murder. Uh, of someone who worked for the Soylent Corporation and they realized that, or the death of someone, they realized that he was murdered because he found out the big secret. And so the film basically follows them going through finding the secret. Saul figures it out first. And when he does, he's actually old enough to remember the old days where earth was livable and, and, and you could eat things like steak and that kind of stuff. Like those were common things that people could eat and stuff. And now these of course are rare. And when he learns the secret, uh, he just decides to commit suicide. He, he goes to a euthanasia center, which these are very common in this future, uh, and decides to commit, you know, to, to be euthanized. And as he's dying, he tells Frank the secret that, that Southern Green is people, which, as we mentioned, don't actually hear, you know, on the film or whatever. And then Frank follows Saul's dead body. Uh, to this processing center and sees the dead bodies going in and the Soylent Green coming out. And he realizes that Soylent Green is people. And so he's trying to to tell the world. And what's kind of really sad about the film, and this is maybe just 70 sci-fi, you get no impression at all that anything's going to be done. Like the police that he tells that Soylent Green is people, they don't – they probably already know. They don't care. Yeah. It's, a necess- it's a necessary evil. Nothing's going to get done. And we really like the like the, the what's really sad is that like the reason that they figure out that soil green is people is because it can't be being made from the ocean plankton because the oceans are dead. There is no plankton, there is no fish, there is no nothing. The oceans are dead, and so they can't be it can't be from the plankton. The only food source that's pretty much left is people. And so that's all they can do. That's like the really, really sad sad part of it is that's kind of how screwed they are that's what that you realize how screwed they are there in the end is because that's literally the only food source left so what else are they going to eat right besides people um but anyway yeah that's that's a kind of a rundown of the plot yeah i kind of got a sense of that when he told the chief superintendent or whoever it is that soylent green is people and he was like yeah yeah just go back to the exchange you know <laughs> just, right. it's like we, we we look after things here and yeah, it's just become something that's quite acceptable, you know, or it has to be accepted. And perhaps if people were to know about this, the general population, okay, there might be a riot. Uh, people might decide to follow uh, in Saul's footsteps, but that could end up solving the overpopulation growth in a way, even if you want to say it in a dismal way. You know? Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's exactly right, right? I think that, that I mean, people finding out the truth about it would either cause them to like commit, you know, to go to euthanize themselves like Saul, or they're just going to like, what are they going to do? Like, what are exactly. they going to eat something else? There's nothing else to eat, right? Like they're going to get past the, the taboo essentially of cannibalism pretty quick and realize that, well, if I don't eat this, I'm dead. So uh, that's, that's like, you know, like people that turn to cannibalism when they get in plane wrecks in the Andes or whatever, right? Like yeah. if that's all that you have to eat, that's what's going to happen. So you're going to interpret this movie from the perspective of a philosopher. And Absolutely. I, I've looked at it from a perspective of someone in economics and I've taken, you know, taken notes and I've seen some, a couple of prominent points there that you, that we could relate to in macro economics and some other theories as well. So I'd love to find out and see if there's anything that we can relate to each other in terms of our disciplines. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you have in mind? Well, I suppose, what? how would you deliver this? And if you ask your students to watch Soil and Green and we're going to come back and talk about it, uh, from a philosophy philosophy point of view, is it questioning what life is? Is it questioning our food sources? Would it be questioning what we're doing to our planet in terms of climate change? You know, is, right. are, these, are these the questions you want to raise and have a discussion on? 
Yeah, so yeah. the kind of things that, that I would talk about, so interestingly, I actually had written, I, I read over it again this morning, I had written a whole big section on whether it would be okay to eat Soylent Green for the sci-fi course that I ended up cutting because I thought it was too kind of dire and drab and it, I, I could just see people coming at me thinking, oh, he's a cannibal, he thinks it's okay to eat people, or, and like – all I was trying to make all the, the only point I was trying to make with it was kind of the one that I was trying to make a while ago that if it really came down to it and that's all you had to be, people would get over the taboo of eating, you know, eating other people really quickly. Uh, and that the arguments against eating people are, are not very good. Like as a fundamental, like you should never do it under any circumstances. Those kinds of arguments are, 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 are pretty bad. Utilitarianly, like if, if you look at it from a utilitarian standpoint, it's actually very unhealthy. Uh, to eat other people. There have been cannibalistic societies and they don't last very long because it's a really effective way to spread illness in a, in a, in a, in a society, right? So if you eat your dead, if they died from an illness and everybody who eats them gets that illness too and then the society dies out really quick. So it's not a very good idea. But if it is like in a, in a dystopian kind of future, it's the only food source. If you can basically prepare it in a way that would eliminate that, that would be a viable means of survival. Uh, so that's one kind of philosophical question that would come out of it is like kind of the ethics of, of kind of dietary ethics. And is it okay to eat people under what circumstances? Would it be okay to be a cannibal and that kind of stuff? And the answer basically would be not very often, but there would be limited circumstances in which that would be okay. But the more important one is the ecological questions that it raises. And there's essentially two questions that Soylent Green raises. One is about the environment. And because it's set in a world where global warming has decimated everything. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, it's like it's 85 degrees. Like it's this constant, horrible, hot hum- humidity mm-hmm. I- I- in the show. And it's actually winter time. Like it's supposed to be set in December or whatever. Like that's how hot it is, is that some winter is now summer and summer is unbearable. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, and, and, uh, the humidity is partially due to global warming. And of course the oceans have risen and that kind of stuff. Actually, maybe that's an inaccurate part of the movie is that if, uh, the, the, the earth had warmed to that degree, there wouldn't be 80 million people living in New York. Nobody would be living in New York because it'd be underwater, mm. uh, at that point. Right. So it's got that environmental issue that is, uh, at its, that, that is obviously at its, at its core. And then the big issue, of course, it raises is overpopulation. Uh, which was a big issue in the 70s, inspired by Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, and which I think we talked about before. And what, like, what would be an effective? And this is where you could really get into economics. I think macroeconomics. Uh, what are the most effective? It's, I mean, it's not money per se, but it's like it's talking about population and how people respond. What is the most effective means? If you had a population problem like that, what would be the most efficient means of dealing with it? Would it be to set up euthanasia centers and let old people kill themselves if they wanted to? Would that be an effective means of dealing with it or not? And if not, what else would be? And those are the kinds of issues that I actually do talk about in the sci-fi course is the, the overpopulation issue. I use a different film to talk about the environmental issue. I use uh, Snowpiercer, but those are the – they're both they're both kind of related. Yeah, like that issue around euthanasia as well as a philosophical question, I'm sure, too, because people who you know question – if there is God, as philosophers had done uh, centuries ago, the expectation would be that, yeah, when your time comes, should you just accept it and wait for that last breath? Or is it more dignified to go about and follow what Saul did and be euthanized? And right. I don't and know it, whether euthanasia and- was in existence back in the 70s, but we know you can do that today in some countries. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and, and if I'm not mistaken, I think euthanasia was at least something that was being practiced in some parts of the world uh, in the 70s. And certainly it's been an option, you know, maybe not a medically controlled way, but certainly people have committed suicide when faced with terminal illness and that kind of stuff uh, for a long time. And that is the other issue I, I use. So I use Snowpiercer to talk about environmentalism. I use Soylent Green to kind of talk about an objection to that, and that leads into – the like the objection is like Soylent Green had all this worry about overpopulation, but that never happened. So why would we be concerned about climate change? Because that's not going to happen either. People are just doomsayers. And I take that out and look at the scientific evidence and that kind of stuff uh, for 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 climate change. But then the issue that gets ra- raised is if we do have an overpopulation problem, problem, could we deal with it with euthanasia? And then that leads to this other question of 
of like just not even just for population control, just medical euthanasia, right? So like the issue is not only is it okay for someone to do that or want that to be done to themselves, is it acceptable for a medical professional to help someone do that, mm-hmm. right? Because you, ultimately you are killing someone, right? Mm-hmm. Is it okay for a doctor to essentially kill their patient with consent in the case of a terminal illness? And a lot of people think not, and a lot of people think people should have that option, and those are that's some of the other issues that I talk about in in the course. Yeah, and I suppose just going back to the the set and the dystopian future that they have, that it's based on the book, isn't it? From written in the nineteen sixties. Mm-hmm. So yeah, make uh, make make room, make room. I believe is the is the nineteen sixties book it's based on. Obviously, this is back in the nineteen seventies. So in twenty twenty two, we don't have flares and we don't have cathode ray tubes in our TVs, but <laughs> impressively, they have a large screen that surrounds all walls in the room where Saul is being euthanized. Uten- ut- uh, right. And we have the locks and we have books, which I suppose are scarce as well. And we didn't see, obviously, with techno- technological advances, you you have to forgive directors and the Oh, sure. You know, yeah. for cinematographers to, who are working on this movie. So you have to, when you're watching this movie, you have to just accept the fact that even though it's 2022 and it, the movies uh, filmed in the 1970s, we have to look beyond that. And I, I think quite quickly you can do, especially where, yeah. where the, the group Saul meets the group of academics. I think they're mostly female and they're uh, going through a book that Frank has found mm-hmm. from the I think it's the CEO of Soylent Corporation, and they had discovered in their investigation that Soylent Green is not actually made from plankton, and it's actually made from uh, humans or people, right. which we weren't to find out until the very end. But regarding the population, you said New York was 40 million people, and it came true in the movie, I think once or twice, they did actually state that. I wasn't sure what the population is today, but people are living on stairs, floors. Mm-hmm. You don't see many people living out on the streets. But is this something that, and even when they're queuing up for food as well, you know, I think it has very similar, people could have, could have related to it back in the 1970s with oil shortages as well, where people had to queue up for oil mm-hmm. and, you know, they could relate to it or when images of famine in, say, third world countries were beamed into people's TVs, they could also see that happening whereby people were queuing up for their rice or whatever other carbohydrates that were given out at that time and proteins. So it does have that almost ominous effect that people may have kind of got sucked into the movie in terms of what will it be like in 50 years time or 60 years time? Will it have right. anything like this? I know sci-fi is dystopian and we are aware of this. Uh, and I'm sure at the time when this movie was made, it, 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 it there, there was this awareness. Um, would you think that I don't know? I never re- read any reviews of what was happening of the movie at the time. Were people mainly pessimistic, or were they quite optimistic, or was it more acceptable that this was just sci-fi at its I, at its best? I th- I think that it had a pretty positive review at the time. I was listening to some podcasts about it in preparation, and I remember hearing somebody say that like Ebert gave it three stars or something like that, saying it was a a pretty confident and good you know sci fi movie. I, I don't think it had any like major negative reviews or anything like that, and it certainly took on an iconic status, right? Hmm. Um, but even if um, were, there, were people worried about the future, like were they kind of optimistic or were, were oh, people yeah. kind of becoming? Um, what do you, what do you call those uh, people who uh, preppers were people in a way kind of prepping for these events then and you know all yeah, under their I, beans and their Campbell soup? Right. I don't know. How, I don't know what to degree people were prepping or not, but I do know that especially overpopulation was a big worry, and that was I think the Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb. I hope I'm not, I'm not mispronouncing that last name. The population bomb was came out in the late 60s and in the early 70s was very much part of the conversation. And essentially his thesis was that we are about to run out of food. Population has is growing in to such a degree that we are about to run out. We're going about to have more people than we can feed just based on mathematics, just based on how much food we can, how much arable land there is, how much food you can produce per acre and how many people we're going to have. He was arguing we're going to run out of food, right? And what – and so – 
at that time, people took that argument very seriously. They, a lot of people thought he was right. And so in that environment, Soylent Green would have really spoke to people's worries and really pulled them in because they really thought that this was a legitimate worry. Here's what makes Soylent Green still prescient today is that – here's the worry – is that the population bomb and Soylent Green, that the worries are still there. It's just the numbers were wrong. So in other words, okay, so let me put it this way. It's, there's a decent argument to be made that the population bomb was right. Its timetable was just off because it didn't anticipate certain scientific advances in farming. So I mentioned this in the lecture. I'm trying to come up with the, uh, with the, the name of it uh, off, offhand. Semi dwarf wheat. So there was a guy that that uh, right invented semi dwarf wheat uh, that fed you know billions uh, uh, in in India at the time. Had it not been for that scientific advancement, they would have run out of food in India and millions would have starved. That would have happened. That's something that 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 Ehrlich couldn't have anticipated. Right. Like so he ends up like his prediction becomes wrong. Right. We don't run out of food because we have these advances and we can now start producing more, you know, more food per acre. Right. Yeah. But that said, regardless of how many scientific advances you have in farming technology, there has got to be a physical limit to how much food you can produce per acre. Mm -hmm. Right. Even with advancing technology. Uh, and so there has to be a limit to how many people the planet can feed. And so if we keep doubling our population every X number of years, which we, you know, in 1900, it was like we were around 1 billion, right? And we're at 7 billion, 8 billion now, right? Like if, if these trends continue by the end of the century, we're going to be at 15 billion, mm. right? There, there's gotten, maybe that's not the limit. Maybe we can advance more scientifically in our, in our farming technology to feed that many people, but there has to be a limit somewhere, right? And so the worry is, is this may not happen in 2022, like it does in soil and green, but the worry is that the, the, the population bomb is worry is still legitimate. It's just that the timetable was off and eventually we are going to have to deal with this problem. Right now we're not dealing with that problem. You know, if you think of the Brazilian Amazon forest being, there's deforestation going on there, and I think it's a couple of football fields per minute is being cleared in, in order yeah, to it's, uh, it's, put in for cattle grazing and farming in order right, to right. feed a population with these type of proteins, and that's not sustainable. And yeah, we're getting, that's not sustainable. Right? You know, and we're destroying the natural habitat, like... We're destroying yeah, all, yeah, yeah. We're destroying all those not, those natural food sources such as nuts and berries that we could live on and get a, a better, higher level of protein and amino acids and whatever other good nutrients are in these nuts, and so right. that we and could there, live off. Right, and there's these these two issues. The, the two issues of the population and the environment are obviously all very related. The more people you have, the more pollution you produce. But then you also have this food problem where, like, the more deforestation you have the less oxygen and that kind of imperial like the 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 deforestation that kind of stuff can cure can keep can get uh CO2 and stuff out of the atmosphere the more you take out then the less of that you know filtering effect essentially you have the worse the you know the, the global warming problem gets right the the only well and then there's also there's also the fact that that um the way that we do our farming is extremely inefficient for the environment and for what we produce and if the overpopulation continues to be a problem, this is something you see in soil and green, right? Yeah. Beef is one of the most polluting foods that there is because not only because of the amount of – like it's very inefficient because you you end up having to grow a whole bunch of grain to feed the cow and then you butcher the cow and you get a few steaks out of it. But the amount of grain that you fed the cow, you could have fed that grain to people and fed a lot more people. You could have literally fed – you know. Thousands of people with that grain, and, the and instead of water you're used as well. And then you've got the amount of water used in it, the amount of uh, it's, it's just extremely, extremely inefficient, and it produces a lot of of carbon dioxide. The entire process uh, creates a lot of carbon dioxide, and so it really, you know, produces uh, really contributes to the global warming problem, right? Do you eat beef? Out of curiosity, I do, I do, and I feel guilty every time I do, but I do. No way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but. I would gladly – I'll say this. I would gladly pay more for it too if that meant that we could reduce the amount that's, that's, that's being produced and reduce the effect on the climate and that kind of stuff. I would, I would gladly eat less.
uh, and pay more and pay more for it as a result as well. But if if it was possible to do a blind test and there was a beef burger and then beside it, you had a, another patty, but it was you probably have the brand over there, corn, have you? Q U O R N. I know, vegetarian. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And you had that there, but there was also another patty, but it was made out of insects, crickets, and so on. Mm hmm. So oh, you'll yeah. probably be able to look at it and be able to distinguish which is which, but just say they were all pretty much identical and, um, they're, you know, flavors fine. You might have a sauces or whatever on it. But if you were to, even if you picked the beef out of a blind test, a taste test and, you saw those options and you realized what you had tasted. Would it put you off having eaten, say, insects? Or would this be something you could be willing to use as a substitute for beef consumption if it meant um, being more efficient in terms of less water usage, less acres being used to get the same amount of protein from it? Right, yeah. If if I if I could do it as a substitute, I totally would. I mean, it would. I have. I'd be lying if I said it wouldn't put me off a little bit, knowing what I was eating or whatever. But if if that was a viable option, I get the same dietary, you know, benefits and all that kind of stuff. That would that would be no problem. Um, what I what I along that line, what I'd really like uh, to be developed is is lab grown meat. And there's been some advancement in this. Um, and I think that that well, that would be that would be great. I would I would eat a lab grown burger in a minute. I have no qualms uh, about that at all. But yeah, so like. Uh, uh, I mean, I think that I mean this is one thing that about Southern Green I think is very accurate is that we are going to get to a point where beef will be very expensive because we are eventually going to have to reckon with the expense uh, and the impact of beef on our environment and that kind of stuff and eventually it will become more expensive and it will become much more it'll become a lot rarer. And we saw that in the movie when Frank went into the apartment or right. the CEO's house and he was after being murdered, but uh, you know because. He wanted to stop the production of soil and green, apparently, when he found out what it was. And Frank went in and had a snoop around the apartment and found some bourbon. And he could, he could, he was excellent at tasting this as if he had never done so or might have tasted it a number of decades back. And right. we could, it's, it's almost like we could, um, taste it with him for the very first time or that's mm-hmm. nostalgia or something that was missing. And again, he took a few things and brought back the beef to Saul. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, that's when I realized the scarcity issue, how scarce these things were, that people weren't actually eating these products or consuming them and weren't able to get them. They were extremely rare. And even when he went to one of the guys, I think he's a bodyguard or one of the security who mm-hmm. ended up uh, tracking Frank down because he knew that Frank knew about the Soylent Green and he was out to assassinate him. He went into his apartment. And right. there was strawberry jam there. Right. And it was on a spoon. So he questioned why this $150 strawberry jam. Right. Yeah. Was, he's like, there's um, no way that the bodyguard could afford the strawberry jam because it's too rare and too expensive. Right. So we figured he must be on somebody's payroll or something like that. Right. Yeah. So when I go out and I see strawberry jam for, say, four euro or whatever, four dollars, I don't think I'll bat an eyelid when I look back at that movie and see what could potentially be the price at $150 based on the scarcity. Mm-hmm. Even a few vegetables there were worth, and I noted here, $279 for some vegetables that would cook up maybe a meal for two. Right. So these are things that people cannot afford by any means based on the scarcity and the global warming and the overpopulation. And we probably had an over, uh, we probably were over experienced overconsumption up to that point. So, right. People are experiencing some of these issues that have economic effects and it is the economic problem that we're faced with when we open up those first few pages in the textbook is the uh, problem of scarcity and choice. And if when things are scarce, we have a choice on what do we consume or what do we produce based on that scarcity issue. And again, with the price supply and demand, it creates these prices that we have to allow the market to head toward what Adam Smith called or coined the invisible hand and to attain an equilibrium price point, which is your prices for these vegetables and strawberry jams. And if people can't afford it, then they they don't just purchase it. They might have to go into a black market to consume it or resort to theft or alternatives, which in this case is your soil and green, which we now know is made of people. Right. No, that's exactly right. Very well put. And what 
what what frightens me is that I was talking before about the two issues being related is that the only I, I'm, I'm afraid that the only way that we won't run in to the overpopulation problem eventually that Soylent Green depicts is because climate change takes care of it for us so that before we get to the point where we can't produce enough food to feed people, the climate will have killed enough of us off essentially that we won't end up to that point. But then again, that's not, that's not a better solution, right? Like that's a, a much worse that's a much worse problem to have. And you mean like earthquakes and devastation, like the natural events? Yeah, yeah, right. Like so, so en- enough places will become unlivable. Um, enough, uh, you know, uh, cities will go underwater. Enough uh, natural disasters, not earthquakes, because earthquakes won't be related to the climate, but okay. hurricanes, tornadoes, you know, uh, uh, those kinds, you know, tsunamis, those kinds of natural uh, tsunamis, earthquake related, so it would be tsunami. Uh, but um, what am I thinking of? Um, not tsunami. Uh, What's the the Pacific version of a of a hurricane? It's a typhoon, and, and droughts and floods and that kind of stuff, right? Which I mean, maybe what ends up happening is that we end up not having enough food to feed people, not because that our population has grown, but because the amount of arid land has decreased to such a degree because of climate change that we we can't grow enough food, right? We don't we don't have enough arid land to do it. Which I mean that we have the same problem just with a number different number of people, uh, but that's what's and that's what makes Soylent Green such a prescient movie and because it's addressing both of those issues at the same time. And even though it's outdated in one way because of the technology and because of the year 2022, it's not realistic that we'd get to that point by 2022. But you still can see a future like that in our own future, right? You can you can see the environmental and the overpopulation problem butting up against each other like they do in Soylent Green. That really still could be in our future, which is terrifying. I suppose when we say we, I'm, I'm, would you be talking about the world population or would you be talking about something like where it's based in New York as in, a, in Amer- America? Because if you look at some countries, people who are listening to this think, well, there is overpopulation in the likes of, um, oh, it's not Calcutta anymore, the capital of India. In New Delhi. Yeah. Well, there's elements of that happening around the world. You know, not not necessarily in the whole country, but if you people gravitate toward urban centers, like in in poorer countries, there may be overpopulation. There is scarcity there. People may not have the social welfare to be able to pay for certain things. They live day by day, um, hand to mouth, and there, there could be cases where there are greenhouse effects or maybe even pollution, man-made pollution, which is uh, resulting in smog. So there are those aspects which, if you combine them to our modern day living in the Western economies, bringing those together does kind of have that ominous effect that we see in this dystopian movie of Soil and Green. Yeah. And so I mean, I, my worry is that that so I'd like to answer your question, I, it's the kind of world that's depicted in Soylent Green is what I is is what I fear, right? So Soylent Green set in New York City, but you get this impression that worldwide there is this problem where you know you have these you know the major cities have become grossly overpopulated, uh, and even you know other places in the world are are not sparsely populated, right? Like it's it's an overcrowding kind of everywhere, and that there's this food scarcity everywhere. I mean, it is a worldwide p- problem in that the oceans have, you know, have died. There's no more plankton in the oceans. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I think is, uh, that, that it depicts and that, that it, that it makes us afraid of, um, is a worldwide situation like that. Do you know what I was kind of somewhat impressed by within the movie is, um, the production facilities of Soil and Green Corporation. Mm. Even though you only see, it, it's a very big plant, but you only see parts of the production when we follow Frank weaving through the conveyor belts and, what what I found was impressive for such a large plant, there were only two people running it. So <laughs> right, it's highly automated. There, there was right? A lot of automation, so they pretty much got it right there, didn't they? With the, <laughs> the automation of um, pr- production. Well, maybe they feel like they have to because if they have too many people involved, they couldn't keep it a secret, right? Um, yes. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, this is one sci-fi element of the of the movie is that there is this kind of like the bodies go in. And a little bit of magic happens and then the Soylent Green comes out, right? Like you're not exactly sure how all of that's, you know, how all of that's happening or whatever. But and whether or not you could turn 
I mean, essentially, you know, humans are meat and the, the crackers look like little carbohydrate, you know, crackers. So whether you could turn the meats into the little crackers or whatever, I don't know if that's actually possible or not, but that is kind of the kind of magic sci-fi hand waving that they do there. Right. But it is, it is impressive to see. You're quite right about that. I, I'm wondering, did it make people vegetarians after watching it, if they could relate it to factory farming? Yeah, I mean, you you totally could, and I could see those kind of arguments coming out of that. I don't know if anybody made that argument um, when the movie came out, um, if people used it as like an argument for vegetarianism or something like that. Um, if it's not, if you're disgusted by eating people, you should be disgusted by eating animals or something like that, right? Which I could see that argument being made, um, but I don't know if anyone actually did. Because I, I I thought of it all right, you know, when you think of the factory farms, say, that might exist and, okay, you have organic farming and that when it comes to raising cattle or uh, chicken, poultry. But um, I, I just had that question, all right. And I, I, you can only find that out if people get back in touch, you know, because, yeah, I remember watching that movie and I did have a sense of this idea of animals being this production facility and I didn't like it and hence I am going to become a vegetarian or a vegan over it. Right, right. Yeah. That would be, I mean, I could see someone, I could see someone doing that. If you went the organic farming way though, that would be a harder argument to make because it turns out that organic farming is often very, it's worse for the environment than regular farming because you end up with stuff that like if you have organic seeds and that kind of stuff, they're not pest resistant and so you have to lot use a lot more herbicides and then the organic herbicide you have to use a lot more of because they're not as effective and you end up running the tractor over the field a whole bunch more times and that produces a lot more pollution and so you end up with an environmental impact that's actually worse than if you just do the non-organic but i could, I could go on and on about organic stuff but but um, anyway that's the, the environmental angle on that and also in the movie, quite early on, actually, the opening scene, I just have a note it here. Uh, it, it was quite very simple and minimalistic. They seemed carefree. Mm. And I, I wasn't sure where I was heading with that until I saw him leaving the apartment and all the people uh, lying on stairs and uh, in mm-hmm. a very uncomfortable, uncomfortable position. I could relate it to st- uh, things I've read in say Ireland and the tenements at the time of the tenements where multiple families would be living in one room and mm-hmm. three story, four story homes uh, at the time of the, at the famine and post famine as well. And that this is kind of quite early on. So I, I, you know, who knows they could have been living on, uh, sitting on stairwells because there was no other places or the rooms were quite overcrowded. So it, it affected a certain social class of people at that particular point in time right hence leading to mass emigration to the likes of the united states and also with high levels of mortality rates too because of diseases Mm -hmm. so we see we see these uh, in that you hear people coughing and it doesn't sound like a healthy cough in the movie but frank very seems very energetic and jumping over these people hands on the wall and on the the banisters uh, in order to get to do his business and his, his investigative work on the, the murder of the CEO of Soylent Green. So there's a, an extreme contrast between that protagonist and the people who are depicting this dystopian future that's very negative. Yeah, um, and, and he's really one of the lucky ones, right? And yeah, he is. Like there's this this there's this vast disparity between him and the CEO too, right? Like you have mm. this kind of upper crust that the CEO is in that gets the meat and has the brandy and right, and then you have where Frank is, where at least he has an apartment and some place to live and right, and he's healthy and that kind of stuff. But then the majority of people seem to be the ones that are laying in the stairwell and are coughing and are not healthy, and it's, it's you know most of humanity is just kind of on the brink and. And Frank's on the brink of that too, right? I think there's – if I remember correctly, there's a scene where he basically is like, you know, when he gets injured or something, he's like, well, I can't go have this treated because they'll they'll take me off the job. And if I'm off the job for more two days, I lose my job and there's a billion other people ready to replace me. And then I'm then I'm right there with them, right? Then I'm I'm in the gutter. I'm out of an apartment. I, you know, I'm on the streets. And so, he, you know, he can't afford to even, you know, to have a wound looked after or anything like that. Yeah. What other aspects in – in your teaching or in philosophy, like if if you were to give a question on this or do you give a question on it in terms of your exams, how, say, certain aspects of philosophy are depicted in movies and what would you expect of them coming from Soylent Green? Um, 
I mean, I guess I would expect them. I don't usually when I give exams, I'm talking about the philosophy and not the pop culture aspect of it. But with uh, uh, Soylent Green, I, I think uh, what, what we've been talking about is the main things that I would uh, that I would address. Right. Like uh, what does it say about the acceptability of euthanasia? What does it say about the dangers uh, of environmental damage and overpopulation or the risks of, of, of overpopulation? That kind of stuff. And then, of course, you know, would you eat Soylent Green if you knew what it was? I mean, here's an interesting question, like an ethical question you could ask. Is the Soylent Corporation actually doing anything wrong? Yeah. Because if the oceans really are dead and there is no other food source available, what else are they going to do? Right? Like it, it's, you know, maybe they've done something wrong by keeping it a secret. Maybe they should be more open about what they are doing. But the actual thing that they are doing may be the only option that's left. It's either that or all of humanity, like, the, the, you know, the, the human race ends. It's either they do that or all of humanity is is dead within a month from starvation, right? And so, right? Like, I mean, there's a really good ethical question to ask there. Are they actually doing something wrong? Because they didn't cause the climate change. They weren't the right. ones that, they're the ones that are picking up the pieces in terms of helping the humanity survive right and the only way to do that is to recycle the proteins that we have rather than let them go to waste underground or being incinerated exactly right in the same way that you wouldn't judge you know the the soccer team or whoever it was that got the that was in the plane crash in the andes and they turned to cannibalism to survive you don't really blame them because that's what they had to do to survive mm. it doesn't seem that you would blame the soil incorporated See, and here's here's something i found i think is very interesting about the end of the film at the very end, after he says so the greenest people, he doesn't actually profess to have that much of a problem with the mere fact that Soylent Green is people. He is worried about what it's going to lead to. He says something along the lines of like pretty soon they're going to be breeding us like cattle. Yes. That's right. It. Uh, yeah. And and that's the real worry. Right. Like is that they, they're lying to us and pretty soon they're going to be breeding us like cattle. And. That worry, so it's, that worry makes no sense. That worry makes absolutely no sense for three reasons. A, it's kind of a slippery slope argument. Well, they're doing this. Well, what's next? And slippery slope arguments usually are, are, are fallacious. B, you have an overpopulation problem. There would be no reason to breed people like cattle. You have enough. You don't need to breed anything. Just right. Just just take what, what, what you got, right? There'd be no reason to breed it. But thirdly, and this relates to something we were talking about before, it would make no sense to breed people to feed people. Because to breed the people, you would have to feed – like you, you'd have to breed them like cattle. You'd have to feed them and keep them alive for a while before you finally slaughtered them to then turn them into food. But if you had the food to feed – the herds of people that you're going to just feed the people with the food that you're feeding the herds, right? Like yeah. it, it would make any sense at all in that situation to start breeding people like cattle, right? That would be completely inefficient for the same reason that beef is inefficient, right? If you've got a food problem, you don't go with beef. You just use the grain that you would feed to the cattle and you feed it to the people. So, but it's interesting that, that, that the character of Frank doesn't, isn't as concerned with the mere fact that they're feeding dead people back to us. But he's more concerned with the fact of what it's going to lead to. But what he, what he thinks it's going to lead to, it's really not going to lead to that, right? So again, the question is, are they actually doing anything wrong? Is maybe the only thing they're doing wrong is lying about it. They're concealing the fact that they're doing it. They should just say, hey, guess where your food's coming from? It's you. So either you can be a food source or you can eat it. One of the two. That's all we got, right? And people would, I think people would be like, oh, that sucks. But I guess that's what we have to do. What did you think of the character, Frank? Uh, it's he is. It's interesting. The character Frank is interesting. It's hard for me to view him objectively, though, because before I saw the movie, I saw the Saturday Night Live sketch. Did you happen to? to I get, didn't see it because of geographic restrictions. I couldn't view it. But uh, the only thing when I went to look it all up on YouTube, all I saw was a, a skit from The Simpsons, and it was Grandpa following <laughs> into the footsteps of Saul. So <laughs> there we go, The Simpsons again. I think you set me up for that one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, here's the, let me let me tell you a little bit about the the, the Saturday Night Live sketch, uh, and then it'll tell you a little bit about what I what I think about Frank. Um, it, the Saturday Night Live sketch is is classic. It's um, Phil Hartman doing a Charlton Heston impersonation. 
and he recreates the ending of it and he has the outfit and the little like the little blue dicky on or whatever and he does the big ending where he says soil and green is people it's people and then they're they're doing it in 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 like the the setup for the sketch is they're doing this a uh, talk show where it is one of the, one of the old cast members from the 80s and then it's John Goodman and they're doing this sketch called it's talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about the movies and so he is playing the, like the producer of Soylent Green, and he's talking about Soylent Green was so successful. We wanted to do a sequel, but what could we do? And so he starts talking about the sequels to Soylent Green that he did. And so he has another uh, another Soylent uh, movie called Soylent White, where in the future there there was no more paper and so they made paper out of people and so it's just this two people sitting and typing or whatever and they're like well this is the future and we, we th- thanks to Soylent White we have an inexhaustible supply of typing paper and then Charlton Heston Phil Hartman as Charlton Heston comes in and says Soylent White is made out of people and they're like oh no and they like touch it and they're like oh my gosh or whatever and then there's another one where they come in this one's got Chris Farley in it where they, it's again it's a it's a food source problem and they come in, and the only food source is called Soylent Cow Pies. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're like, well, you know, we're, we're, it sure is a bleak world that we live here and whatever, but at least we have Soylent Cow Pies. And then Charlton Heston comes in and says, Soylent Cow Pies are people. And Chris Farley's like, oh, my God, I thought we were eating cow flop. And he's like, no, it's people. And they freak out because it's people. It's it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> other other versions of it are like Soylent Teal, where house paint is made out of people. Ah, I'm trying to think. They had a Soylent Stooges was one of the ones. And it was a comedy. It didn't work out well. And then the, the big punchline at the end is like, so what we decided to do was go back to what, you know, you know, Gave us the money in the first place to Soylent Green 2. And so they show the big ending of Soylent Green 2. And it's Charlton Heston coming out saying, Soylent Green is still made out of people. They didn't change the recipe like they said they were going to. It's still people. And he, ah, it's, it's just, it's classic. I'm not doing it justice. It's absolutely <laughs> hilarious. But it's this kind of, this, this grandiose, just kind of dead on, but also over the top impersonation of Charlton Heston um, as Frank in the movie. Yeah. Once you see that and then you watch the movie, you can't help but just see Phil Hartman kind of doing it, right? Uh, so it's okay. almost hard for me to take Frank seriously. Yeah. But it's such it, – but it is an interesting – it is an interesting character and it is a very interesting question of what you would do if you were Frank, right? And you discovered this. You're, you live in this world and you discover that the only way that people are surviving is by eating people – Hmm. How do you react, right? Do you do you do the overblown, run through the streets and, and yell out to everyone that Soylent Green is people, or or do you try to make it known some other way, right? Like that, it, it's fascinating. Yeah. Got to go on social media. <laughs> Just done. <it. laughs> yeah, right now it's now it'd be a tweet. Did they not realize there was Facebook and Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now yeah, Frank would just get on tweet and Soylent Green is people hashtag. <laughs> hashtag hashtag Soylent Green is people, right? Um, right. I, I, I couldn't really take to the character initially anyway, and I think that set me up. I, d- I didn't know what to expect, you know, when I saw this guy going around and then invading the the, priv- the house and taking rooting through the fridge. And But then when you look back and I'm thinking, you might have to do the same if you've never experienced this type of wealth and looking at the goods and the produce and so on that you'd never had tasted and you probably only dreamed up or heard stories about true soul. And would you pick up a piece of fruit and eat it or take a piece of steak back with you? Oh, yeah, you yes. Would. So, you would. Yeah, absolutely. That aspect of Frank, I don't judge him at all for when he's stealing the jam. And, well, maybe the jam because the guy's right there or whatever. But with like the steak and stuff, the guy's dead or whatever. It's like you do what you have to do to survive. This guy's got steak. You've never eaten it before. You're eating that steak, right? And yeah. And in a world with that many people – I mean, crime is prop- more than likely just going unpunished all the time anyway, because there's just no way to keep up with everything, mm. right? Um, and so why wouldn't you steal somebody's steak and their bourbon, especially if they're dead, right? Like, yeah. who else is going And he's bringing it home to Saul, really, anyway. It wasn't really for himself. Right, right. He, all, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, he probably knew Saul would appreciate it more than him, mm-hmm. perhaps, you know. 
Right. But although speaking of stealing people's property, something that we haven't talked about, which is necess- necessarily economic or not, but that there is the issue of the furniture, right? Like there's this interesting thing in that's in this world where apartments come with young girls as part yes. of the apartment, right? They call them furniture. Mm. And it's it's apparently a kind of prostitution where a young woman in this world, obviously, food and shelter is rare. But if you're a young woman, you can essentially be assured food and shelter shelter by becoming latched to an apartment. And I mean, it is essentially prostitution. It's it's trading sex for not directly for money, but for food and shelter. But the the money would be, you know, if you were trading your sex for money, it'd be used for food and shelter anyway. Right. And so that that issue. Uh, there's like a prostitution issue that comes up there. There's an issue of like sexual slavery that perhaps comes up there. And so that's another kind of a whole ethical question that Soylent Green uh, raises that often gets neglected because of the whole Soylent Green is people and over, you know, overpopulation issue that is the focus. But there is that issue there as well. And that's why I thought there was something going on there that there might be a twist because when when Charlie Heston or when Frank Thorne called her, you're, you're a piece of furniture – Mm-hmm. I was kind of quite like as she was, she was taken aback by it, but she was very calm and somewhat. I I, I wouldn't say robotic or withdrawn, but in a way unemotional. And I don't know whether that's a reflection of her character, the way she's supposed to be, like a piece of furniture and somewhat inanimate. And so, I these are issues that were very topical at the time with the feminist movement, and I'm sure mm-hmm. there were people that were angry with you know with what what was going on depicted in that movie mm-hmm. and maybe that was an incentive to think well if if they're expecting our population to be like this in 2022 well sure as hell no we're not going to have women that are going to be like that in the year 2022 and you know these are issues that are raised in that book make room make room mm. that were quite topical at that point in time based on Ehrlich's population bomb and the feminist movement and the role of women in society. And, you know, so these are very um, excellent and well-crafted themes or sub-themes within the movie that are quite good to, to, to discuss or even talk about and take it down that particular avenue. You know, so there's things in there that deals with social issues and as well as philosophical and economics too. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And it's, it's not clear in the film, whether or not like, so there are arguments that prostitution should be legal, right? Those same arguments would not entail that sexual slavery should be legal, that they would like argue against sexual slavery. Right. And so the idea would be that prostitution should be legal, but those who uh, participate in it should do so of their own free will and of their own free accord and should not be forced into it by extraneous circumstances and that kind of stuff. Right. And, so the question of the furniture in the film is whether or not these women are doing this of their own free accord or whether they're being forced into it. But that being said, when you say you shouldn't be forced into it, what do you mean? Do you mean forced into it by someone? Certainly not, right? But what about being forced into it because of economic pressures, right? Like, I mean, be, can can a – in in the in the world of Soylent Green – can a 22 year old who has no other means of supporting herself do anything but be a piece of furniture, right? Like it's either that or death. So she really has no, she has no other option. And so she might choose of her free choice, like of her free accord, she might go through a rational deliberation and realize that this is what she has to do to survive. But it would be hard to say that she does it of her own free accord, that essentially, even though she's not being forced into it by someone else directly, that it would be sexual slavery, essentially, because she has no other choice and she's being forced into it by her circumstances rather than a person, right? And then you wonder whether it's, you know, would would anyone ever uh, uh, participate? Would anyone ever be a piece of furniture or participate in prostitution if they weren't forced to do so by economic circumstances? And so maybe anyway, – anyway, so that, that's like a whole other issue that comes up there, which I haven't researched that much, but that might make for – I want to do a sequel to the sci-fi course – that might be a good lecture topic. So maybe she's uh, p- considered furniture because it's the board or the the company is dominated by males, so they're male are on top. Mm-hmm. So if it was a situation whereby there was females, you'd wonder would they have a male piece of furniture too? Right. 
So there's there's those issues as well, you know, if, if there was something like that, if that was kind of somewhat depicted in the movie. But again, we're going back to culture and society and that of the 1960s and 70s, where those barriers were kind of broken down and people were making movements from the ground up to make changes, social changes on all issues, including feminism and and so, uh, those other social issues too. Right, right. So yeah. it's it's a great movie that is able to pick up these things. And look, if someone else was in a different discipline, like engineering or architecture, they'd be looking at, uh, they may not be aware of those situations, but can look at the buildings and the infrastructure and the fire escape. And, you know, the people always have those different viewpoints. Mm-hmm. If there's an artist, I don't, I don't know now, was there any pieces of art you know, mm. expensive, expensive pieces of art in, in, in the, in the apartment. Right. I, so some of the technology and the furniture were quite space age. You know, you might have seen them in Star Trek, the way the, you scan the, uh, mm-hmm. scanner on the outside of the door and there's a, an automatic sliding door with those 1970s curved features. And, right. you know, there was nice pieces of interior in, inside the building too. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, it also has the first appearance of a video game in a movie. Yeah. Was yeah. that the first appearance? Yeah. I, I believe so. I think I read that when I was doing a little bit of research. I think I read that on, on somewhere that that was the first appearance of a video game in a movie. I think it was Pong, was it? It was a Pong. Something like that. Yeah. Know. Yeah. It, was, it looked like Pong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if there's any name on the thing, but it looked like Pong. And, mm-hmm. or no, do you know what it was? I think it was Space Invaders. Oh yeah, let me let me look yeah. it up. Let me double check. She it. no, she played the game. Ah, uh, okay. She walked away with it from it and said, "Yeah, I'm after shooting down so many spaceships." Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah, okay. So space invaders. So yeah, um, brand endorsements. Yeah, that could have been one of the first as well that yeah. we've seen in a movie. It's also it's it's called Computer Space is the actual name of the combat arcade game, but I think it's, I think you're right. It's like modeled after space invaders. It's essentially just space invaders with a different name. Yeah. Well, um, I thought this was only going to be a half an hour, Kyle, because <laughs> <laughs> I have a half an hour on the other one to make it an hour show. So, and I was keeping the last half hour for a bonus. Well, we've done about two and a half hours in total. Yeah, we've done quite a bit, but it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, um, yeah really enjoyed it. Yeah. Again, thanks very much, Kyle. And I really appreciate it. And as always, you are, I could I could say a philosoph- philosophical rock star, but I have to say you're an economic rock star. So <laughs> it was great to be able to have this conversation and draw this type of discussion out of me with you. So I loved, you know, I liked the movie. I don't know if I want to say I loved it, but uh, <laughs> I liked the movie. <laughs> I watched it in two parts. So uh, I watched 60 Minutes one day and 35 the next. Cool. And that's the way I went. And uh, yeah, it, it was good. It was enjoyable. And it was a good discussion to, to have. Well, I really enjoyed discussing it with you. It was, it was a lot of fun, especially with someone who hadn't seen it before. I was That was a really neat experience. Um, if you uh, if anybody watches the, uh, the sci-fi uh, course instead of just listening to it, if you watch it, I actually eat a little bit of Soylent Green or a, a type of Soylent Green or whatever uh, on camera just as a little joke at the end of the lecture right before it. So there's, there's all kinds of little fun little visual gags and stuff that we pulled uh, in the course, and that was that was one of it. It was actually green Kit Kats that my, my um, producer had had got from overseas somewhere, and it was like they were like mint-flavored Kit Kats, and they were really good. It was really good, but they were green, so they looked like Soylent Green. Anyway. anyway. Maybe for St. Patrick's Day, then we'll um, do a Soylent Green <laughs> something or another. <laughs> McDonald's, awesome. and you're going to have your Soylent Green milkshake. <laughs> Sort of the green milkshake, or they, I wish the Cheez Its would put out a, a, a green Cheez It because that's like I've always kind of thought it was like little green Cheez Its, but anyway, <laughs> it was fun, Frank. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Kyle. I'll talk to you then. Bye. Right. See ya. Bye. Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show 
by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the Economic Rockstar website. If you enjoy this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.